is not true, because if they had objected only to this speaker, we would have arranged another venue for October. But that's where we stand, unfortunately caught up in our country's cancellation culture. Our response has to be to work even harder to win this November and in 2024. We look forward to Dick Morris telling us how. When I introduced Dick last time, I expressed my wish for a sequel to Armageddon, How Trump Can Beat Hillary. And now we have one, The Return, Trump's Big 2024 Comeback. This, this is the timely advice we need. A book signing will follow this session. Mr. Morris is super qualified to tell us how to win from piloting Bill Clinton to victory in 1996 to advising winning campaigns of presidents and prime ministers around the world to running successful domestic campaigns of senators and governors. Mr. Morris has by no means rested on those laurels. He has gone from strength to strength, launching in 2021 a one-hour radio program on WABC airing from noon to 1 p.m. on Sundays, and a weekly half-hour show on Newsmax TV, Dick Morris Democracy. Indeed, every time I call him, he's about to go into a taping. I also urge you all to visit his website, dickmorris.com, which is rich with his articles, comments, and videos, and interesting news items. With great pleasure, I give you Dick Morris. I've been thrown out of better places. Sorry to take you all over the side with me. <laughs> okay. Sorry to take you all over the side with me. Um, well, you're a courageous bunch of people, the West Side Republicans. Good. When I was waiting for the elevator, I figured the elevator was it. <laughs> now it appears you're much, much bigger than that. <laughs> um, well, I bring you, who are you? Yeah. I bring you uh, greetings from a very special source. Uh, I spoke to President Trump today at about 3 o'clock. And I told him I was coming here. And his reaction was typical. He said, what are they, West Side Republicans? <laughs> I said, yes, sir, you made them. <laughs> so um, he sends you his regards. <laughs> um, I believe that, uh, that we are going to win an unbelievable victory on November 8th. Um, and I do mean unbelievable, transformative. Uh, I think that we are going to obviously take the House, and I think it'll be by north of 40 seats. I want to say north of 60 seats, but, you know, this is a mic and there could be a take. <laughs> Sorry. But um, I do believe it'll be uh, very significant. And I do believe we're going to capture the Senate. Uh, I think it'll be a minimum of 51, 49, but it could be as much as 54, 46. Uh, we, uh, I'm intimately on top of each of these races. I talk to them every day. Uh, in terms of keeping our existing seats, uh, we're out of the woods really in Ohio. Vance is fine. We're out of the woods in North Carolina. Bud is fine. And the only difficult one is Oz. And the debate is tonight. In fact, I should be watching. But um, the... What? It's repeated in the Oh, good. Where? Um, both debates, the one with Selden and the one with that yeah. jackass in Pennsylvania. Yeah, but where are they repeated? Newsmax and on uh, Spectrum 1. Right. Spectrum 1. Great. Good. Well, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that uh, I think we're going to win in Pennsylvania. Oz is now actually ahead, and, uh, and we'll see what happens tonight. But it should be okay. Um, I figure he's a doctor. He's got a good bedside manner. <laughs> you know, 
And he's probably not the first stroke victim he's visited, but maybe the first one he's ever run against. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then and that'll bring us up to 50, and then you'd have to get to 51. And Laxalt in Nevada, I just spoke to his campaign manager as I was coming upstairs here. Uh, he's been consistently two to three ahead. The problem is Nevada is a den of thieves, so you have no idea what the final result is going to be, or if it'll even vaguely reflect reality. But you know we. We can't move for a change of venue in a Senate race. <laughs> so, so um, but, on the other, but we have some reinforcements coming. I think that Walker uh, has, has gone out to the lead in Georgia, uh, half a point for the lead. You know, when he started to debate Warnock, I was nervous because, you know, he's a football player, he's not a debater, and Warnock's a polished preacher. Then I realized that a football player knows how to take coaching. <laughs> you know, the coach explains the play. And Newt Gingrich was his debate coach. And he really gave him a great pointers. And every time the topic would came up, he would bring it back to Biden and inflation and uh, worked really well. Um, I also just checked the math uh, today. And uh, Warnock and Walker together account for 90 Four percent, ninety-four percent of the vote. And so there's a six percent, or actually eight percent, ninety-two. There's eight percent that will not be for either one. Three percent are for the libertarian. God knows what the other five will do. But when you look at that eight percent, they are seventy-five percent white and only twenty percent black. And Walker is winning twenty percent of the black vote and seventy percent of the white vote. So probably if he's forced to into runoff, we'll win that runoff this time. Uh, so that would be 52 seats. And then in Arizona, uh, Masters is waging a very good campaign against Kelly. Uh, he didn't use the slogan I suggested against Kelly, who you know walked on the moon. And I suggested his slogan should be, what on earth has Mark Kelly ever done? <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> but he, he he didn't use it yet. He might, <laughs> and uh, and I think that uh, he's at the moment one or two behind Kelly, but uh, I think he's uh, moving up. So we have a decent shot at fifty-two, and then to get to fifty-three, uh, we have to win. Um, uh, well, Georgia, no, Kelly would, uh, Masters would be fifty-three. And for 54, the most likely pickup is right next door in Connecticut, where Leora Levy is uh, only four points behind uh, Blumenthal. She's been a pet project of mine. I've been pushing her from the beginning, and I think, I think there's a damn good chance of that. By the way, it really doesn't matter, because if once we're 51, we're fine. And bear in mind that next time, right now, two-thirds of the Republic of the Republicans are up for re-election. I mean, two-thirds of those up for re-election are Republicans. 33 each year in the Senate. And it's about 22 Republicans, about 11 Democrats. So we were really vulnerable. But in 24, it flips. And about 22 Democrats are up, and only about 11 Republicans. So I believe in 24, if Trump wins, which he will, I think we, can, we have a shot at 60 votes in the Senate. We, we were, I mean, like Manchin is up for re-election. He's not going to win. And, and a bunch of others are. And uh, I think we could get up that high. So I'm thinking basically of a house where we have like a 30 or 40 seat edge and a Senate where we have a three or four seat edge and then going into 24 when we can expand that. I told Trump today, I'm quoting myself, I said, you have to realize that you are inevitably inevitably going to be the next president of the United States. Inevitably. And he said, how's that? <laughs> and I said, it's inevitable, sir. Nobody will challenge you in a Republican primary. He said, why is that? 
I say, because you won all of these other primaries for other candidates you endorsed in every single state except Georgia. And, and the, the winnings were incredibly impressive in every kind of state. And it brought home the point that you cannot be defeated in a Republican primary. And everybody agrees with that, including DeSantis and uh, Pence and uh, Haley and Cruz and any of the folks that might run against him. So he is the guaranteed Republican nominee. And when you think about that, there's almost never a unanimous choice of a nominee unless it's the incumbent president immediately seeking re-election. It's quite a feat. And it depends on whether you, <laughs> whether you believe in the tooth fairy or not, but there is no way we are headed toward anything less than the most god-awful recession, depression you've ever seen in your life. I mean, the raising of interest rates to deal with inflation is number one draconian, number two unsuccessful. And uh, it's going to trigger massive unemployment. I told them, I said, I think that your odds of winning are about the same as FDR's against Hoover in 1932. I think it's about the same situation. And I think we'll look back at it and say, why the hell did we ever worry? And uh, I think that, and I said, you're great, but it's not you. Any Republican is going to win that election uh, because of the disaster the country will be in. So I said, so it is inevitable that you're going to be the next president. The only thing you have to do is not F it up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's the kind of summary of my book. <laughs> but I get to a little more detail in there. But uh, I think that, that we're in wonderful shape going into this. I think the important thing is that the country had a real-time, honest, fully upfront manifestation of what the total domination of democratic politics results in. Nobody can mistake it. Nobody can say, well, the bill was watered down, the Republicans stopped him from implementing his program. Uh, they did. He ran roughshod over the Republicans. They can't say, well, the t special times, there was COVID, there was the war. There wasn't. There was COVID. COVID was over and the war had not yet started. And it's ultimately the most vivid demonstration you can imagine of the superiority of Republican economic policies. The um, flip side of that is that we paid no attention to what the Democrats wanted when we controlled Congress. We passed our tax cut without even asking them. Uh, we passed everything on party line votes. So we have a pure Republican solution under Trump and a pure Democratic solution under Biden. And you look at the difference. I mean, my God. Uh, you know, I mean, I have to go through the stats with you, but it's incredible. And uh, it's obviously illustrating the defect of the Democratic Party's economic doctrine and dogma. And the important thing is that they know it. Uh, I mean, they, they, they get it. That's why they invent abortion and, uh, and uh, the gay rights, gay marriage, uh, the uh, Mar-a-Lago documents, the uh, January 6th committee, all that stuff is what I call WMDs, weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> they're, they're trying to get our mind off the economy and off illegal immigration and off the increase in crime and off the deterioration in America's international prestige and off the drop in real per capita income, uh, all of that stuff. Under Trump, the middle class, working class, the median working class family, 50th percent, made $6,000 after inflation, after taxes, more a year than when Trump took office. That's 100 bucks a week. Under Biden, because of inflation, they make $100 less a week. So you're putting Ben Franklin in your wallet one week and taking him out the next week. What? So going down 100 and 100 again. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But, but I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible and, and just very clear to the average American. So I think that the, that the case here is just overwhelming. Um, I think that I believe it's more significant than any of that because I believe that the, de that the historical pattern will doom the Democrats to a decade of defeat. 
a decade of debate. The, the historical pattern is clear. Whenever the left-wing party loses an election, it does not move to the center. It moves further to the left and proceeds to lose 10 years of elections. When Reagan defeated Carter in 1980, the Democrats turned around and nominated Mondale and then Dukakis, for God's sakes. And then finally, after 12 years, they got some sanity and nominated my old boss, Bill Clinton. And his platform was, I'll move you to the center. I'll sign welfare reform, I'll balance the budget, uh, because I'll restore the death penalty in federal office and crack down on illegal immigration. He built 230 miles of border wall. Don't forget, it's still there. That's and, a lot of you, right? Well, whatever. But, but the, <laughs> <laughs> let's put it this way. When he signed the welfare reform bill, some noted that his arm was twisted. <laughs> he once asked me, why should I sign this bill? And I gave him the most important substantive argument I could find. After researching all the statistics and consulting with economists, I said, you lose if you don't. <laughs> And that was very clear. But, and the same thing happened in Britain when Thatcher defeated Callaghan and became prime minister. The next three Labour candidates were Callaghan, Foote, and Kinnock, three crazy leftists, and they got crazier every election until they got sanity and nominated Margaret Thatcher. And the reason this happens is that people leave the left-wing party. They say, hey, I'm not this anymore. I'm, I'm not a Democrat anymore. Let me see a show of hands here. How many of you used to be a Democrat? Yeah. Well, that is cool. That is cool. Yeah. I didn't ask you to enumerate your sins. This, this is not a confession. <laughs> but, I mean, you look at that, a third of you all raised your hands. And, uh, and that's going to happen more and more because people will see how bad the Democratic Party is. And then a vicious cycle sets in. The more independents and moderates leave it, the more the crazies dominate the primaries and the more nuts it becomes and the more people leave it and the cycle just goes around and around. And history suggests it takes at least two or three defeats for them to eventually get the point. And I do not believe that the Democrats will be able to win a national election until after 2030. Now, in terms of this immediate situation, I wrote a column today entitled, Biden, Going, Going, Gone. <laughs> Remember Mel Allen with the Yankees? That ball is going, it's going, it is gone. Mickey Mantle hit another home run. And, um, and you know, it's, uh, and that really is what's going on with him. Uh, he's, the magnitude of the defeat he's going to have on November 8th is so significant that they can't run him again. They have to go to him and say, you can't hit our ticket again. And you have to pull out now, otherwise we have to spend two years explaining you. And we want to spend these two years justifying and building up our new candidate. And uh, Biden will have to do that. They'll tell him we will not remove you under the 25th Amendment <laughs> for two reasons. The first is we don't want to admit the huge mistake we made in nominating you. And secondly, we sure don't want to admit the worst mistake, which was nominating Harris as the VP. <laughs> so, so I think that uh, I think that they are going to go to him and insist you have to say now you're not going to run again, and that'll open the floodgates to all of the Democratic candidates. And now the phenomenon I spoke to you about a few minutes ago will kick in, which is that the whole primary electorate of the Democratic Party has moved so far to the left that they can only nominate someone that can't get elected. And um, you're going to see Bernie Sanders at the top of the heap, Gavin Newsom, AOC, I think, is going to get into it. And uh, yeah, and you're just going to see uh, a, a chamber of horrors on that side. Uh, then, I think, the uh, elders in the Democratic Party, the sane people, the professionals, will say, hey, wait, we can't let this happen. 
any more than we could let it happen in 2016, when it looked like Sanders would be the nominee. And the solution then was to go to a certain lady and beg her to get into the race to save them from Bernie Sanders. And that lady is coming. I, I believe Hillary will be uh, most likely the Democratic candidate in 2024. Uh, and if it won't be her, it'll be like a left-wing crazy Bernie Sanders. And the funny thing about it, which I write about in The Return, is that they're using my damn playbook to do it. <laughs> uh, the memos I wrote to Bill in 1992 said the key to winning this nomination is to capitalize on the angst Democrats feel for the defeats of Mondale and Dukakis, and go to them and say, look, we followed the crazy left so far that we lost two races in a row. Now vote for me. I'm a new Democrat. I'm for the death penalty. I'm for welfare reform. I'm for balancing the budget. I'm for reforming affirmative action. I'm for deten detention of illegal immigrants who commit crimes. I'm for a border wall, all that stuff. And based on that, he got the nomination because they were sick and tired of losing. Well, Hillary is using the exact same playbook, and I don't get royalties or anything. <laughs> uh, she's going to go to the Democrats and say, look, you lost the House, you lost the Senate, the President has been basically forced out of the race, don't do more of the same. You've got to be nuts to repeat that. Einstein, what do you say? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting good results the last each time. And um, she's going to go and she's going to say, I'll be the alternative to that, just like my husband was in 1992. And I think that argument will be very persuasive. And I think that she will end up as the most likely Democratic candidate. Now, don't worry, Trump will absolutely destroy her. Uh, absolutely, it should be in smithereens when it's over. The ideology is going to kill her, but the integrity problems will be worse, and uh, she can't stay out of trouble. Let me explain to you why Hillary is corrupt. Um, she, she is corrupt because she is a believer in original sin. Every scandal of hers has at the bottom of it a small original sin that she's been trying to cover up. And it causes this huge, gigantic scandal, not because of what she did initially, but because of the length she went to in the cover-up. I first learned this about her in 1995, when uh, the Washington Post sent word to me that we're not going to really dwell on Whitewater anymore. We don't think Clinton made any money there. We just want him to release his tax returns so we can make sure that there, wasn't a, there was no personal gain from Whitewater. So I met with Bill and I met with Hillary and I said, so release your returns. And their answer was great. They said, well, we'll release 1979, 1980, 1982, and 1983. And I said, did you leave something out? What about 1981? And they said, we can't release that. I said, why the hell not? You didn't make any money. You didn't pay any taxes. Hillary was being paid bupkis at the law firm, and you were a state employee. Why the hell not? And she wouldn't tell me. She said, absolutely not. And when I kept arguing it, she said, stop arguing. Stop it or get out of here. I am not going to do it, and you're not going to talk to me about it again. Never mention it again. So I didn't. And then about four years later, it came out that she had taken a thousand bucks and made a hundred thousand in winnings on the future the commodities market, futures market. And the statute of limitations on insider trading lapsed five years after the after the tax return would have been released, which meant she couldn't release it until nineteen ninety five or ninety six. And then she released it on that day. because uh, she didn't want to be held criminally liable for what she obviously did, which was insider trading. And she would not release her tax returns before that. So again, a minor sin becomes this whole mountain of scandal that resulted in Whitewater going ahead, Starr being appointed as a prosecutor, Clinton getting impeached, all hell breaking loose because she didn't want anyone to know how she cheated in the futures market. Then the second example came in the Paula Jones scandal. 
when you remember she was a state employee who Clinton asked to come up to his room, sent a state trooper to get her, and obscenely approached her. Well, Paula said she would settle this lawsuit for no money, no admission of guilt, and no apology. All she wanted to drop the case was for Bill to say he did not send a state trooper down to get her, uh, because that would imply that you know, she was a hooker or something. And, uh, I, and I told Clinton, no problem. She's a state worker. I mean, you could have a hundred legitimate reasons for asking her to come upstairs to your hotel room. And Hillary said, nope, we're not doing it. We are not, we are not agreeing to that. I said, why not? And she, went, she said, I, the spectator, the conservative group, has said that Bill uses state troopers to get women, and we can't ratify that charge by saying we sent someone downstairs for Paula Jones. So because of that, we have a special prosecutor, we have Monica Lewinsky, we have impeachment, we have all of that stuff, because freaking Hillary wouldn't <laughs> let us do that. And then, and then the third example is the email scandal. Uh, she, she becomes Secretary of State, and they make a lot of money off their book sales, but that's one shot. And, uh, and she's always been very insecure about money. Always saying, Chelsea, will we'll have to be brought up in poverty or something. And, um, and she was determined to make money from this. So she had Bill go around the world giving speeches, arranged by a group called Tenneco, a consulting firm. And those speeches would go to their joint bank account, you know, because she was, separate, she was his wife. And uh, they would go around the world to, pay, to countries and companies that needed favors, needed approval or <coughs> regulatory recognition or diplomatic recognition, and would say, yeah, well, we can help you do that, but don't you want to have Bill Clinton speak at your next meeting? And they said, oh, that would be great. It would be an honor. Yeah, and it'll cost half a million dollars. And they said, oh, okay, we'll pay that. But that transaction, pay for play, had to be cloaked in secrecy because it was obviously bribery. So this is not the kind of transaction you can do arm's length. You know, I'll appoint your brother-in-law and then help me in bills in the future, like Biden did with Manchin's wife. You can't do that. It has to be a minute-by-minute -minute thing. I'm going to help you get this contract. I'm going to help you get this recognition. Uh, but you have to invite Bill to give a speech, and he has to give the speech. And that involves emails. So that's why she had a secret server, because she couldn't let those emails surface, because they were proof of play by play, pay for play, and she'd end up in jail. So they cloaked the email server in a way nobody would find out that she had it. And like all of her cover-ups, it blew up in her face and stopped her from being elected president. And, you know, I used to work for the lady, and how crazy it would make me that there were always these easy ways out, and she always refused them because she insists on the perfect image of integrity, uh, never original sin. And uh, it's unbelievable. It's pathological. Um, and when she ends up where she is, and uh, her integrity scandals will just destroy her capacity to ever be president. Thank God. Um, you know, people say you work for the Clintons, and I always say singular, please, <laughs> because uh, she was always an unbelievable mess. And uh, once Bill took me aside and said, what are we going to do about Hillary? <laughs> once I... Um, she loved you, though. Yeah, yeah, Hillary sends me a Christmas card every year, but there's white powder on the outside, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't open it. <laughs> And um, I once did a poll for Bill. I went to him and I said, you got to set your summer vacations coming up. You can't take it in Martha's Vineyard like you always do because the photos of you hobnobbing with beautiful celebrities doesn't do you any good. It hurts you. And uh, you can't do that. He said, well, where can I go? And I said, well, I'll, I think the Rockies. And he said, well, what do I do there? And I said, I'll let you know. So I did a poll on where he should go. And then I did a poll of what he should do when he got there. So I'm telling him, you, you can play golf, but you can go hunting, you can go fishing, but, you know, this, you, but being very clear as to what you can do and what you can't. And then I said, and you have to live, not in a luxury hotel, you have to live in a two-person tent. And he said, with Hillary? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Um, now, I want to spend a moment on Donald Trump, who was a chapter in my book. Um, I believe that Donald Trump is one of the all-time great presidents of the United States. Forget re-election. I don't know if there's more room on Mount Rushmore, but this guy deserves to be up there. Not yet, but he will be after his second term. And uh, I believe, because you look at everything, you look at the American economy, where it soared, and it soared with the middle class being benefited. He passed the first tax cut in history that was aimed at the middle class. They always say it is, but it never is. It's always trickle down. But here he pee an increase in the child care tax credit to $2,000 a child a year it was a huge infusion of benefit to the working class. Uh, then he negotiated trade deals. And the objection to every trade deal is always that it becomes a race to the bottom. Who can make the product more cheaply? Who can pay the workers less? Uh, and they win economically. And uh, he said, no, we're not going to do that. I will negotiate a new trade deal with Mexico, a new NAFTA. But I'm putting a provision in it that says that no product will be admitted to the United States duty-free unless the average salary of the workers who make it exceeds $15,000 a year. No, it exceeds $15 an hour. And, uh, and, and that, that's written into the agreement. And that is the first time in the history of the world that a wage agreement raising the wages of workers, not lowering them, has been built into a trade deal. First time ever. Workers in Mexico. Yeah, Mexico workers, I meant that. So the car can't come into the United States unless the workers, who normally make two bucks an hour, now are making 15. And I asked him, why'd you do that? And he said, well, first of all, to help Mexico, but secondly, because that way they're not undercutting American workers, uh, because they're being paid the same as our guys are. And, uh, and they're not undercutting them. Um, and that came in very handy when he had to stop illegal immigration. So he went to uh, Lopez Obrador, the left-wing president, and he said, I'd like you to hold all of the illegal immigrants in Mexico so we don't have them suing us in the United States. Because the liberal judges had said that even if you were here illegally and not a citizen and not even a legal resident, not even a resident. The minute you set foot on American soil, you inherit the whole panoply of constitutional rights, which meant that the litigation about their getting amnesty or not would uh, spread over years for each case, and we couldn't afford it. So we said, I want them to remain in Mexico. And Obrador said, no, why the hell should I do that? So, he, so Trump got back to him and said, OK, today's Friday. On Monday. I'm signing an executive order imposing a 25% tariff on all Mexican products sold in the United States, which would totally destroy their economy. I mean, poof, overnight it vaporizes. And as Trump likes to say, and he saw the wisdom of my position <laughs> and said, of course, sir, we'll be happy to do that. And um, in one stroke, transform foreign trade as an, ins as an instrument for really a capitalist oppression of the workers into one that really empowered the workers and raised their wages significantly. The left is all hep on global climate change. And whether it's happening or not, the fact is that the United States achieved a higher reduction of its carbon emissions than all of Europe and Japan combined. And the only thing was it fell short of the increase of carbon emissions of China. <laughs> But, uh, but literally, he replaced uh, coal with natural gas in the generation of electric power. When he took office, natural gas was about 20% of our electric generation. Now, it's over, when he left office, it was over 50. And uh, that, in t that was the decisive step. It was the only real carbon reduction in the Western world that happened. Europe talked about it a lot, but they didn't have the numbers to really do that. Um, I think that, that in his immigration policy, he wanted and tried and will, when he wins, 
move away from the idea of uh, do you have family here, do you, is there a family reunification issue, to make it a question of can you help America? Um, do you have a high school degree? Are you fluent in English? Are you literate? Do you have skills? And really import people into America that will help the country rather than drain from it. And um, you look at, and, and let's understand why we have the inflation we have now. When Trump was president and COVID hit, he decided, I'm going to protect the American people from the economic fallout from COVID. And I don't care how much it takes. So he set up the Restaurant Relief Fund, the Paycheck Protection Program, and plenty of programs worth over a trillion dollars to protect people from unemployment and from being forced out of business. And it worked beautifully. You read the economic journals and they say the United States had less impact from COVID than any other major country in the world because we spent the money to protect them. Now, it's no big compliment because we alone in the world can just print our own money. Uh, the other countries can't because they have to be more or less on the gold standard. But he did it and uh, increased our debt by a trillion, but we had no trauma from COVID. And before he left office, he had restored two-thirds of the jobs we lost under COVID. Then Biden takes office, and the first thing he does is spend $2 trillion of economic stimulus. And the country was already way overstimulated. And that money couldn't really produce more products because the supply chains were stretched thin, the workers were all refusing to work because the social benefits were so high, the, um, the, the literally couldn't produce that level of goods. So you had too much money chasing too few goods and just caused macro huge gigantic inflation. And then, when the inflation continued, he passed the Inflation Reduction Act <laughs> that added another trillion of spending, another trillion of stimulus, way overheating the economy. Now, there was only one cure for that kind of inflation. That's a depression, a hell of a depression, a huge recession. Because it's like you see a patient with high blood pressure that endangers his life. The only sure way of bringing it down is to bleed him to death. <laughs> then he has no blood pressure. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and that's really what they would do with the economy. With rates so high that nobody can build a home, nobody can finance a home equity loan, nobody can finance a car, and production just drops dead because consumption falls apart. The only thing you can do is really stop the economy from growing and lay people off, have a recession, and force prices to go down because nobody has any money. And when it hits rock bottom, the laws of supply and demand will raise the price and you recover. But in the meantime, you have two or three years of unbelievable misery. And there is no cure for it other than that. And Biden just walked right into it and created this problem that is destroying the American economy. And uh, he's welcome to it, but it is absolutely destroying his presidency. So um, I think Ronald Reagan is true, uh, Ronald Reagan, I mean that, but, but Trump is truly one of our great all-time presidents. And then foreign policy. Does anybody here believe Russia would have invaded Ukraine under Trump? I mean, are you kidding me? Uh, Kim Jong-un sent a message to Trump when he took office saying, I have a button that can blow up America. And Trump wrote back, hey, Buster, I have a bigger button than you do. And, and that shut him up. He was tame and docile for three and a half years of the presidency. And when Trump left office, he began shooting off missiles again. And um, he just totally intimidated him. And Putin knew that he couldn't get away with stuff, and China knew they couldn't get away with it. Right now in the Ukraine, we're seeing the result of Trump's policies because he went to NATO in his first year, and he said, hey guys, uh, you're not paying 2% of your GDP for defense, like you're obliged to, so we're pulling out of here, we're out of here, goodbye. We're no longer gonna defend you. And they raised hell, and the press wrote his foreign trip was a failure, and he's reviled throughout Europe, but he got 290 billion of extra defense spending in Europe, and that's the weapons Ukraine is using now 
to defeat Russia. And, uh, and in terms of China, he induced a massive recession in China that is still happening. And uh, Xi, the president, is going back to Mao's ridiculous economic theories of socialism, the great leap forward and the cultural revolution. And uh, China is absolutely becoming a basket case economically because, again, of Trump's 25% tariffs that slashed their sales to the United States by one third and completely crippled their economy. So he brought our enemy low and that's pretty terrific. You know, I could take more questions, but I need to sit. COVID knocked my legs out from under me. I had COVID about four months ago and, uh, and I got, became short of breath. My legs became weak and, uh, and it's just, uh, what are we doing? Yeah. yeah. Give him the mic. Come on. Good. I'm really not. I'm going to But you play one. listen to my radio show on WABC yep. every, every Sunday at noon. And Doug is on with me, and uh, he's, he's great on that. And I think it's, it's just terrific, and he's my best friend. And, you know, Eileen had a stroke uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, and she uh, is bedridden and will be for the rest of her life, which I hope goes on for a long time. But she uh, and it impaired a lot of functioning. So, um, in order to avoid terminal loneliness, I reached out for my best friend. And Doug has moved in with me, and it's been vital in, in my recovery and in my ability to sustain all of this. So, um, let me throw the floor open to questions, and uh, we'll talk about any topic you want. Yeah. Well, yeah. well the, the problem is what are we doing about election integrity and making sure we don't have a January 6th mob again. Um, election integrity is going to be completely solved in the United States in the first few months of next year. And the only public figure who has said that was yesterday, my old friend Hillary said it, but she didn't say it would be solved. She said Republicans would steal the next election, which is kind of her take on it. Uh, there's a case coming up to the Supreme Court called Moore v. Harper, which will become as famous as Roe. And it's brought by some conservatives in North Carolina who know how to read. <laughs> and they read the Constitution, and it says that the times, places, and manners of holding legislative elections for the House and the Senate shall be determined by the state legislatures, not by the governors, not by the secretaries of state, not by the state courts, not by the AGs, but by the legislatures. And in Minnesota, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and North Carolina, you have Republican legislatures and at the moment Democratic governors who have vetoed any of the reforms that are necessary. In parenthetically, in Arizona and Georgia and Florida, the, the model of all reform legislation has passed and is now in effect. So you're not going to have cheating there this year. Photo ID at every stage of the process, double signature verification. If you submit a mail-in ballot, you have to include the last four digits of your social security number. Um, no ballot harvesting. I mean, a really great bill. And it passed in those other five states, but the governor has vetoed it. Under Moore v. Harper, they will no longer be able to veto it, and they will have no say in it. And by the way, no say in reapportionment. That will be exclusively the legislature's prerogative. So um, it's a bill that will, it's a decision 
that will basically eliminate the problem of voter fraud. And it can't be overwritten because it's a constitutional provision that the state legislatures have this power. And uh, I believe this is a problem that is shortly going to be solved, past tense, gone. Nice of you, thank you. If you read in my book the opening, the opening forward, yeah, it's a personal statement from me, and it says writing a book without her is like one hand clapping. Uh, she's written 20 books with me. Uh, Steve Ducey at Fox and Friends once had me on and said, what's it like writing a book with your wife? And I said, well, Steve, a lot of people feel that I, she does the research and the footnoting, and I write the book. And I said, that's not true. We divide it in half, and she does her half, and I do mine. And we swap at the end, and we read the others. And she said, does she ever say, honey, you know, I love you, but this isn't much good? <laughs> and I said, well, Steve, she skips the first part. <laughs> <laughs> But go ahead. Jerry and I were roommates, roommates in college. We lived together. What? Yeah, 85th and West End. Yeah. That seat has always been the closest thing to a hereditary monarchy. <laughs> and, uh, first, you had, uh, first you had Ted Weiss, then you had Bella Absook, then you had Jerry Nadler. It's a hereditary monarchy, and it's going to stay that way for a while. Yes, sir. We all know what a wonderful friend you are to Jerry Nadler and Bradley at Columbia College. Did you also know Billy Barr? Uh, no, no. Nor... Uh, nor the AG, Eric Holder. No, there were some classmates I didn't meet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. Definitely, we need a question from a candidate. I'd like to introduce Michael Zimbleskis, who is the candidate for Congress in our district. Oh, my goodness. Come on. Yes. Yes. And what's your name? Mike Zimbleskis. Good. Good to meet you. Thank you. Good. How are you doing, everybody? This is not a, this race is closer than people think. I actually have two Democratic district leaders that have endorsed me already. In this, on the west side, not the east side. I'm getting a lot of people on the east side that were Maloney people that says they're not voting for Jerry. Now, I'm not saying it's a slam dunk. I'm just saying it's closer. But the big thing is, I think it's going to be a low voter turnout. If we get the people out to vote, we can't have Republican Islas like we did last year with Curtis Sliwa. Because the Republicans in Manhattan did not show up. And, uh, you know, Adams got less votes than, uh, uh, sorry, de Blasio did in his two elections. And if you would have came out for Curtis, we would have Mayor Sliwa right now. It would be completely different. Come out. Zeldin is very close. Get your friends out. And one of the things I'm doing, we need building captains. You get me your information, I will get you the voter list of your building. You make sure the Republicans, independents, because they're breaking our way, and I'm telling you a lot of Democrats are breaking our way especially Hispanics, because and people that are living in the Niger complex are really upset with the illegals coming into New York and getting all these benefits. 
Uh, the Nyjah complex, the uh, basically the housing projects. Yeah, it's called uh, yeah New York City. Yeah, and I, I've been helping the I've been an advisor on some uh, <coughs> sorry on some Nyjah uh, uh, committees to try to save them and get better you know uh, repairs and everything. So I am known in these areas, but like I said, it's an uphill battle. I'm not getting coverage by the media at all. They are ignoring me. Even though I'm a known voter getter, I've gotten over 45,000 votes on the east side in the state senate race. I lost, but I still got over 45,000 votes, which is more votes than a lot of elected officials have gotten in any winning campaign. So, you know, it is a close race. We can put Mike Henry in. We can put Lee Zeldin in. And hopefully, if miracles happen, you can put me in. And that would be a shockwave to the nation. Make sure you get out the vote. Get your friends, your neighbors, get your enemies out the vote. Michael. Yes, that's a, not a problem. Thank you. Okay, not a problem. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, Jerry, Jerry is vulnerable because he fell on his face in front of the whole country on the impeachment. And... Uh, you know, it's an interesting story about his race against Maloney. Uh, they had a debate, and Jerry didn't attack Maloney, and Maloney didn't attack Jerry. It was the most civilized, <laughs> delicate debate in the world. So I called Jerry, and I said, what gives? Why didn't you go after her? And he said, because the New York Times editorial board told both of us, if either of you attack the other, we'll endorse the other. And in the, in the New York City, the New York Times endorsement yep. means everything. It's the only effective political machine left in America. And Nadler did not attack Maloney, and he got the endorsement. Um, and uh, it's so incredibly uh, incestuous and corrupt. We had a question yeah, back there, first, yeah. Uh, two questions. One regards Trump, one regards God's Hillary. Before I interrupt, don't you think the thing that happened on January when you said you'd come back to one time, those four hours when he didn't respond to anything? That's my first question regarding Trump. My second question regarding Hillary. Well, Newsom is pretty left, and uh, the only one who's not is Buttigieg, and they put him in to run the stimulus program to pass out the goodies, but I don't think that's enough to make him viable. As to the January 6th thing, look, what's he going to do? He tried to get 20,000 guardsmen there to protect the Capitol, and uh, he told people to go home peacefully and go back to bed, and yeah, and patriotically. Um, it, this is all a contrivance, like the Reichstag fire, exactly. really. Yeah. Um, student loans, yeah. what's your feeling on that? Well, it would be nice if we all had the forgiveness when we had to pay it, yeah? <laughs> yeah? And, uh, and I, think that, that there, I think that many people are feeling that way. Uh, on the other hand, I have to say that the level of debt that people graduate with is so obscene that it really dooms them to middle-class poverty for decades. What could be done uh, about this? Well, the thing that can be done about it, and it's quite specific about it, is there is no reason why higher education needs to cost as much as it does. Uh, the, uh, the average faculty member at a university work six hours a week of contact hours. Some go up as high as 12 hours a week. Nobody is higher than that. And uh, that is a policy. And uh, there's no reason why that has to exist. What happened was that you had a few elite colleges, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, everything, and they had highly qualified faculty whose main job was research and writing, and they threw in some classroom time. And uh, they weren't, they, we never asked them to teach a lot uh, because their function was really prestige, research, and writing. Then higher education became universal, and everybody flooded in, and we had state schools and everything. And, but the pay structure and the work rules and the traditions remained exactly the same. So they got the six hour and 12 hour weeks. So there's a wonderful college in Pennsylvania. I wrote a I wrote a chapter of one of my books about it, called York College. 
And your college maintains a tuition one third lower than Lafayette or compar Lehigh comparable schools in Pennsylvania. And they do it by requiring their faculty to teach 12 hours a week. They do it by limiting their administrative expenses to 10% of their budget, which includes the salaries of their CEOs, their presidents, and so on. And thirdly, by banning any use of capital funds for anything other than revenue producing <coughs> properties. And those steps have brought their costs down to a point where they can do very well, and their test scores, their ACT and SAT scores are right up there with anybody's. So the, the lobby of the left-wing higher education community is keeping these prices so high that they shut everybody out. And they basically become public employees, uh, but with the, with the theoretically being a loan. And uh, it's very much like any kind of government workers. And that's where you need to crack down. Uh, let's have, let's, we need to leave time for a book signing um, so that we can uh, <coughs> leave the room between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. Okay, okay. And okay. so, all right. The rule here so is anybody. One more uh, question. No, no, it's so, fine. Uh, anybody that's not going to answer. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Schwarzenegger does not appear in any ballot yeah. And yet, it seems as if the media and other politicians are having a preemptive strike and a postemptive strike for fear that he's going to run again. Yeah, well, so of course. So they want to get that ball rolling. Of course, and the main thing they want to do is distract people from the economy and from Biden's terrible record. But the, look, the fact is these primaries throughout the country for the Senate and for governor were basically primaries of Trump against McConnell. And Trump put up his candidates and McConnell put up his. And uh, Trump beat him in every single race. And uh, so McConnell has been sitting on his hands, not funding the guys that beat him and, uh, and endangering them. But they're now coming back and Trump is putting some dough into it, and I think they're all going to be okay. Uh, and what will happen to McConnell, I don't know. It depends on how many new senators we elect. Uh, but, uh, but that's really what this was all about. And the reason Trump bit, bit into it and went into it is because he wanted to demonstrate convincingly that he owned the Republican primary electorate and that nobody could screw with that. And uh, DeSantis and everybody pulled in their horns when they saw that Trump can't lose a Republican primary. And given the construct I opened with, that means he's inevitably the next president, unless you think the economy's gonna recover, in which case you're delusional. <laughs> okay, so listen, anybody who is desperate, I'll tell you. Okay. Kirk Trump what? Where you want to sing it? What's the matter? You can't sing it? <laughs> okay. While we're waiting for that, take another. Yeah. Well, executive privilege originated with George Washington when uh, he sent uh, John Jay to negotiate a treaty with Britain. And the treaty was very unpopular. And they demanded to see the instructions he gave Adams. And uh, John Jay. And uh, I said John Jay, right? And um, Washington claimed executive privilege. I don't have to share my confidential communications with the public. And Trump obviously is covered by that. Uh, if it's happened during his presidency. But the courts have, have been mixed on that. So we're not thinking about these things that Biden puts through on his own, it looks like. He's not going through Congress to get these, a lot of these bills. No. got to go bill by bill. Order, order, order. Order. Yes. My, my ask, Joe. <laughs> You're on.
back uh, you know um, my book is entitled The Return the working title was The Second Coming <laughs> people talk me out of it yeah uh, could you discuss the FBI's probe of Hunter Biden's activities in Ukraine and other places well, and how that's going to destroy Biden I, if you go back to the 1970s the CIA committed mayhem around the world assassinating Allende and a lot of foreign leaders and that led to hearings in the 1970s chaired by Senator Frank Church. And it completely tore the agency apart and restructured it and they stopped pulling that kind of garbage. And they became a pretty cleaned up agency. Sometimes ineffective, but never obnoxious. And uh, the FBI has to go through that same process. And that's what's going to happen in the session of Congress. Here, here. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Democratic Party is famous for its October surprises. Uh, in the uh, W, they tried a, a fake letter which went to the draft board. It was totally forged. Yeah. With, with Trump, they tried well, I mean, the Billy Bush video. Okay, so my thought, which I was mentioning to you earlier, this strange speech that Biden gave, yeah. bathed in red, is that all these theories around? Yeah. Are they going to declare martial law, suspend no. the election, something crazy? No, no, is they're not. Planned. They're just going to lose it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I called, I've been advising Lee, and uh, I called him about two, two weeks ago, and I said, abortion is killing you, absolutely killing you. And uh, what you need to do is go out there and say that I will not change New York state law. And uh, I said that that completely cuts them out from under their argument. It pulls the, the rug out from them. And there's a noose around their neck, so <laughs> it's not good news. But uh, and he did exactly that. His current dad says, I will not and I cannot change New York's abortion law. And that changed the whole race overnight. And that's why I think Zeldin's going to win. I think that the, Republic, the Democrats stupidly put all of their eggs in the abortion basket. And, they, and the Republicans could dismiss it just simply by saying, I won't do it. You know, it's fine. And uh, I believe, the other thing I believe is that the Democrats relied on character negatives to win these Senate races. They said that my opponent is the worst horse thief in the world and stuff. And um, I believe that the, the answer to that is to go back and say, your one vote will, ca will determine who casts the 51st vote in the Senate with the majority. Will your one vote cause borders to open or to close? Uh, inflation to go on or to come back? Gas prices to go on or go higher? Your one vote can do that. So by transforming the election from a referendum on two human beings and their personalities and their abortions and everything, uh, you make it a contest on issues where it's like a referendum of yes and no and They've been, I was just on the phone with Laxalt's people, they're going to do it. In Arizona, they're doing it. And that, combined with the abortion input that I've been giving them, I think really is, is giving us a, a decisive win. Okay, two more. Yeah. I just want to correct the record. I misspoke earlier. The Boz Fetterman debate is repeated at 11 on News Nation, not Newsmax. What is that? Well, you can look under the guide. Okay. The cable guide. Right. Channel 126. Yeah, um, you and then the person uh, behind you. One more question. Um, why do you think Trump lost last election, and how does that change? I mean, even if well, the was there's a long, long answer to that, okay. and uh, I don't want to get into it now. Uh, very simply stated, <clears throat> there's a secret ballot, and that was the Achilles heel. We know that there were 57,000 illegal ballots in Arizona, and we know that Trump lost the state by 11,000. But we can't prove who those 53,000 people voted for. If they all voted for Biden, yeah, we can say the election was stolen. But we can't prove that because there's a secret ballot. And that meant that their theft could never be discovered. And that's the short answer to it. Yeah. Right here in the city, this is very lax, so this is an experiment, and I have 
Uh, this gentleman here was on the, the Latin show Sunday, and he's going back on again. Mr. Ron Pagan, who may or may not be here tonight in District 7, and myself in District 13, that speaks Spanish. We're going out to Latin vote, we're finding that yeah. they tell us to our faces. I was with Kathleen one day, and they all said they couldn't sign the yeah. ballot for Republican. Well, they I, registered Democrat, but they vote for Trump. They will yeah. vote for us if we reach out. But do you think that we are reaching out well, or do we yes. encourage the GOP? To yes, I think the, the, the move system? here, which was I write about in my book, that was really one that we made in the campaign. The Democrats went crazy about illegal immigration as the issue to get Hispanics. And uh, we said, or I would say to the president, look, uh, everybody that votes here, immigration is in the rear view mirror. You know, their ancestors came over uh, 50 years ago and stuff. So immigration is not their issue. Um, jobs, uh, education, uh, inflation, that's the issues. So. Then Antifa came to the rescue and began to tear down statues of our famous Americans and putting the United States down and the woke left revised our textbooks and said the U.S. is an evil and a racist country. And the Latinos whose ancestors risked their lives to come here were damned if they were going to see America put down like that. And they also have seen in Venezuela and Cuba in Guatemala and Mexico and Vietnam, they've seen the process by which the left undermines democracy and they see it happening here. And that's resulted in a gigantic flipping of the Latino vote. Right now in the polling, DeSantis is carrying the Hispanic vote in Florida. Abbott is carrying the Hispanic vote in Texas. Yeah. New York, I don't have the final data, but I think Zeldin's doing well. But you know, New York politics happens late because we don't have television that covers it. You know, the networks pay no attention. And so it takes a long time for us to learn the candidates. And it all breaks at the end. And I think... What? We have a club that is only focused on registry Democrats. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, that this race with Zeldin is going to turn dramatically tonight in the debate, because I don't think Hochul's any good. And because, and I think in the next two weeks, and I think it's going to be a landslide. And I think it's going to take uh, certainly large numbers of state legislatures. Lawler, Mike Lawler, who's running in Rockland, who's a very good guy, told me that he expects a flip of five congressional seats in New York State, but only has 25 of them. So that's pretty incredible. Well, thank you. This was great. Thank you. So where's he going to sign the books? We're going to sign books in the back corner where the lady's holding up the books.